Hello and welcome everybody. This is Grandmaster Sam Shankland and I'm here to do my third video on my series of the Bishop Against the Knight. So previously we saw some cases where the bishop was just much superior and it was because we saw an open board where the bishop had good targets, oftentimes with an imbalanced pawn structure, and in particular in an endgame with a pawn race, a bishop can affect both sides of the board at the same time. Now we're going to see a situation where the knight dominates the bishop. And that com often comes in situations where the knight has a good outpost in the center, or the bishop is completely lacking scope or targets to attack. And uh, here I'd like to go over a game that was, or a fragment of a game that was played between Julio Becerra and Pascal Charbonneau. I really like the way Becerra handled this position. It struck me as very professional and strong. So here, it looks like we have a very tense situation with opposite side castling, but a lot of classical positional principles are really going to shine through. And I really like Becerra's move, just simply ignoring everything and playing bishop d5. His goal with this move is to exchange off these light squared bishops and leave black with the dark squared bishop on e7 that's blockaded by its own pawns and unable to really participate much in the action. So uh, black played b takes a2 check, which is a natural and strong move aiming to somewhat loosen the white king side pawn structure. But after king takes a2, we quickly saw that after rook b8, and black can't really avoid an exchange of these bishops, because if this bishop were to move away, this rook is lost. And you might say, well, bishop b5 attacks the queen. But unfortunately for black, after bishop b5, white can play c4. And now black has to retreat the bishop back to c6, which will once again allow this unfavorable bishop exchange. So black tried rook b8, aiming for direct counterplay. And after bishop takes c6, check, takes c6, knight d5. We've sort of reached a classical situation of good knight against bad bishop in a, a way that would leave, in my opinion, at this point, black is completely lost. If you look at this bishop, it's just utterly useless. Blockaded by its own pawns every which way. You look at white's pawns that are almost exclusively on light squares. I guess there's the pawn on h2 black is unable to get at. And this bishop just has no route back into the action. In the meanwhile, white's knight is really well centralized on d5. It cannot be expelled from this square because it's a very nice outpost. It's controlled by a pawn and there's no black piece that can attack this knight or try to exchange for it without uh, losing material. And a knight in, this, in a centralized outpost is generally better than a bishop, just because if you look, it controls all these important squares. It can attack just about anything. And black is unable to do anything about this knight. So black tried queen b7, looking for counterplay. Obviously, white has no interest in walking into checkmate in one. So he played rook b1, and after king d7, white has to just figure out how to maximize his chances of playing with the knight against the bishop. So why doesn't everyone pause their videos and see if they can figure out how to do that? Okay, so if you want more time, please keep your videos paused. The way to highlight this advantage of the knight over the bishop the most decisively would be to take all the heavy pieces off the board and just leave the superior knight against the inferior bishop. And that's exactly what Becerra attempted to do. The move b3 is aiming to open up with some files on the queen side to trade off a whole bunch of pieces. The problem with this move is after something like a takes b3 check, the white king is starting to feel very open, the a file is open, there's a lot of problems. Black also could play just rook fc8. So I really like what Becerra did. He played rook hd1. Now this puts a rook on an open file. I mean, you could argue it's just the most natural move. But I don't think it's the open file that Becerra was attracted to. He doesn't really want to move the knight on d5 because it's so awesome. So uh, you might ask, well, what does the rook actually do on d1? And I would say not actually that much, but it's en route to a much better square. White's idea is he wants to bring this rook to a3, which will then uh, attack the weakened a4 pawn, keep the white king safe, and potentially prepare b3, at which point he can safely start to exchange pieces without having to worry so much about his king. So rook hc8, and indeed we see exactly this from Becerra. He plays rook d3, rook c5, rook a3. And now black played rook b5 here. In my opinion, this was a mistake. I think he should have just chopped on d5 and uh, hoped for the best. Now there's no doubt that white should be winning there, but at least after takes, takes, and queen takes d5 check, black is now has a pawn for the exchange. It should be lost, but at some point he can move his queen away, say back to c6, and then play d5. He has some presence in the center, and most importantly, this bishop on e7, which as we'll see was just never played an active role for the rest of the game, will have some kind of say in the position and have some kind of contribution to make. Instead, black played rook b5, with the idea that he's uh, attacking this pawn. 
And I can sort of see how uh, White would not want to play a move like c3, which would protect the pawn. There's a lot of problems that could arise from this. Among other things, rook takes beat d5 is an improved version now, because after e takes d5, queen takes d5 check, White is unable to play b3, at least not without opening more lines, and that's something he shouldn't be too happy about. Still, White has a very strong move here, and I'd like the viewers to please pause their videos and see if they can figure out what it is. If you want more time, please keep your videos paused, but at this point I'm going to proceed. So, this pawn on b2 is hanging, and White decided it was in his best interest to simply move the pawn forward. Now, he could play b3, I think it would be very likely to transpose to the game, but Becerra chose b4, which I think is even more forcing than b3, because right now, if White is able to get c4 next, so then the rook is basically trapped, and then he's completely lost. So, Black had to play a takes b3 check, but after the simple rook b takes b3, Black has a real problem. Pieces are starting to get exchanged, and uh, that means that knight's superiority over the bishop will soon be highlighted in full. For instance, um, let's say Black were to play bishop d8, which is not tactically losing immediately. After something like rook takes b5, takes, 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 rook a7 check, Black is already forced to play king e8, because if he were to move the king uh, to c6 or c8, then the f7 pawn would hang, as well as everything else in Black's position. And after king e8, let's say move like c4. Here, Black is basically in Zutzwang. He can't even move. The rook is hanging if it goes to c5 and just king b3. And after king b3, black has no moves. There's just nothing for him to do. The king is stuck here. If it goes to f8, there will always be rook d7. So if king f8, rook d7 clips the pawn on d6. The bishop is stuck on d8 defending this pawn on f6. The rook in theory could go back, but it does absolutely nothing. And it just seems that white is completely winning here every which way. I think the simplest plan is to just start running this king to the h4 pawn. Ah, oh, that seems very effective. Still, I think this was better than the game continuation, because at least there, white didn't have any passed pawns yet. In the game, black tried rook takes b3, and here, uh, I really like the move Becerra chose. I think rook takes b3 is very, very natural, and would probably be the choice of a lot of humans, but there's at least some annoyance here, and uh, the white doesn't have a plan to directly win the game. Well, after the move Becerra chose, c takes b3, which struck me at first as a little bit risky because uh, it allows the second rank to be weakened. But more importantly, white has a passed pawn now, which will do wonders in the endgame. So black played rook c8, which is a very natural move. He wants to keep the white queen at bay and potentially threaten moves like rook c2. And uh, there's no doubt white could proceed with a slow move like rook a4, which hopes to play rook c4 perhaps and trade off rooks. But again, I take no issue whatsoever with what Becerra played, which is very simple and very strong. Queen a6. So this allows black to start pawn clipping pawns on c2 and must be accurately calculated. Luckily, it's not especially difficult to do so. After queen takes a6, rook takes a6, black played bishop d8 here. But if he were to play rook c2 check and start taking these pawns, unfortunately for him, after rook a7 check, the bishop on e7 is going to be lost, and uh, that will be that. So black needed to play bishop d8 first. This gets the bishop out of harm's way, and I guess has some ideas of putting him somewhere more active. Though even still, there's no real squares available on this diagonal that would be anywhere useful for black. And uh, even if there were, it would lose the f6 pawn, so that's something to worry about. But at this point, white should be very precise and find one more really good move uh, to seal the deal. So let's see if you guys can pause your videos and figure out what white should play. All right, so if you want more time, please keep your videos paused. King b2 is the best move. This is simple and strong. White does not want to allow the move rook c2 to come in. And right now, black is basically in Zutzwang. There's almost nothing for him to do. This bishop can't move, because if it goes to c7, he's losing the pawn on f6. If it goes to e7, there's rook a7 check, or knight b6 check even. And uh, the rook can't really move, because uh, no real squares along this file. Rook b8 doesn't seem to help at all. After rook a7 check, the king is being forced backwards. And the king can't even move. King e8, rook takes d6. So black tried rook c6. And after rook takes c6, king takes c6, b4. Black actually resigned here, 
But for our purposes, we're going to continue the game just to show how it could have gone. And here we're seeing the ultimate example of a bishop being utterly useless against a knight. If you look, let's say uh, bishop b6. And of course, white can take the pawn on f6. That is a clean pawn and there's nothing wrong with it. But we're going to do something else instead just for illustrative purposes, which is h3. At this point, if you look, white's pawns here are all on light squares, meaning that the black bishop has absolutely no way to go and harass them. And that being the case, the bishop is without targets. Similarly, black has this backwards pawn on d6 that is perfectly blockaded by the outpost of knight on d5, which renders it incapable of advancing and using black's pawn majority. All the meanwhile, white has a pass pawn on b4 that will soon win the game. So let's say black simply waits and sees what white has in store. Very quickly, black runs out of moves. If he moves the bishop again, bishop b6, here, I mean, we could have done it last time too, but I was just making a point. Even after we made that point, still here, we're going to start taking pawns. Knight takes f6 as a clean pawn. So black could try something else, say king b5. This is very natural, get the king in front of the pawn and so on. But after a simple knight c3 check here and king c4, White is starting to invade. And here b5 check will be the next move. So say black plays king b6, knight d5 check and king c6. This might look a little bit annoying at first because the white king would love to play something like king b5. And after b5 check, king d7, it's not immediately clear how to make further progress since b6 runs into king c6 and the white king has been blocked and black is ready to play bishop takes b6 next. But... If white is just a little bit patient, he wins very easily. So there's a couple winning strategies. One is to realize that this king on uh, d7 actually has no way to join the fight at all, since all of the key advancing squares that this king could use, e6, c6, b6, a6, are under white's control. Black actually has nothing he can do. He can't run the king up to the b5 pawn even. So let's say white just starts running. King d3, and his plan is very simple. Run the king to g4 and take the pawn on h4. And black actually has no way to stop this, because if he ever tries to move the bishop away, I mean, the pawn on f6 will hang. So here, let's say, I mean, I don't even think you have to take it, but let's say you do. Takes, check, and knight back to d5, stopping king d6. Now black has all of the same problems, except that the king, he doesn't even have a pawn for it. Now the bishop on a5 is still useless, and uh, the white king is running in. Similarly, you could say, okay, well, what if black instead of this tries to run with the king? First of all, he's going to lose this race. I'm going to get to g4 before black can get to g5. And white even wins the race by two tempi instead of one. But even if he didn't at this point, after b6, the king is uh, unable to come back to the defense on b7. And white is simply going to queen this pawn. Black has to sacrifice his bishop for it right away. And that'll leave him hopelessly lost, of course. So that's really bad. In addition to that, white has another winning plan, which is just to invade on the queen side. King b4, and here uh, black, again, is pretty much in Zutzwang. White's going to play b6 next. But even if black had somehow passed here, I don't know, let's, let's say we play king b3, king e8, king b4, king d7, and we got this position where black would be in Zutzwang, but it's white's move, and white plays b6, he's still going to win this game because after king c6, he can play king a5 and he's ready to play king a6 to push this pawn through. And after king b7, king b5, we once again see further power of Zutzwang. If black could just sit and wait here for the rest of the game, he might well be holding a draw, but he can't. He's got to move right now and the bishop doesn't even have a legal move without getting lost. And once the king moves king c6 and then white will take on d6 and he'll play king d7 and win the bishop and then take all of black stuff, king e8, king f7. And here black is just hopelessly, hopelessly, hopelessly lost. So I was a little bit disappointed that Charbonneau resigned this game as early as he did, which was in this position here after b4. But I totally understand why he did, because he was a grandmaster. He had no problem whatsoever seeing the writing on the wall and realizing that his position was beyond repair. Another key point that is very important is if king b5, white does not have to allow black to play um, king c4 and can simply proceed with king b3. And uh, here, the knight being better than the bishop, black can't even trade the bishop for the knight because after something like bishop b6, even if white were to take here, which looks very foolish to me because he can win much more cleanly, after something like this, white is still left with a winning pawn endgame.
because he has the outside pass pawn and black's pawn on d6 is backwards and unable to create a pass pawn effectively. So while we saw some uh, examples of the bishop dominating on the open board before, here we saw in a more closed position where the bishop was blockaded by his own pawns and restricted defending his own pawns and stuff like that, that it really got dominated by this outpost at night. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, we'll be seeing two more ones on this bishop versus knight imbalance. Until then, this is Sam Shanklin, and uh, have a good day.